Pankaj, you're the CEO now. John is the chairman. So now, so now you have to play John in meetings. Uh, it's like, <laughs> how is, how is I'm this? learning the Southern accent, you know, yeah, but it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's getting there. <laughs> CEO and co-founder. John Chambers and Pakaj Patel took Cisco Systems from under two billion in revenue to 50 billion in revenue. They created 16 world leading products. John became a close advisor to heads of state all around the world. He knows more about global technology and almost anyone and is an amazing mentor to a lot of leaders in the technology ecosystem. Now they just came out of stealth with Nile. They're using AI to reinvent the entire global networking industry. There's over $75 billion spent a year maintaining these networks. That's not gonna be needed anymore. Let's hear from John and Pankaj, what they're doing to change the global technology infrastructure. I'm Joe Lonsdale, welcome to the American Optimist. Uh, Pankaj and John, thank you for joining us today. Joe, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Let's start hearing a little bit about your backgrounds. John, you were in Cisco for 20 years, scaling the company in a historic time. I think you had maybe 11 giant products that crossed a billion dollars. Like, t- tell us a little bit about what you guys did at Cisco. Sure, well, we were in the right spot at the right time, Joe. And as we all know, growth covers up a lot of mistakes, but uh, we went from a company that uh, had 70 million in sales when I joined and it went to 48 billion. Uh, we were number one or number two in 15 of 18 product areas, number three in just three. Uh, we created 10,000 millionaires among our employees, so we shared the success cool. with the company. Uh, we were the most valuable company in the world at one point in time, as you often see in waves of new technology. We did 180 acquisitions together with Pankaj, who ran all of engineering 180 there 180 acquisitions. 180, and uh, we wrote the textbooks. In the early 90s, people thought acquisitions and high tech failed. They were right, they almost all did. And we rewrote the textbooks, and our innovation engine was do-it-yourself, strategically partner or acquire. So it was a rush, it was really exciting, and we balanced a uh, great economic return for our employees and our shareholders and our partners, uh, but also we won every social award there was almost to win in terms of giving back. Uh, it represented you know, in the best of both worlds. You have a, a goal for economic return, a goal for society, and so we won it from Democratic presidents and Secretary of State, and Republican presidents and Secretary of State, uh, from China, from uh, uh, France, and other locations around the world. So it was a real, real fun ride. Now I've switched over to JC2 Ventures, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And Pankaj was, you were CTO, you were also, you were also head of product in CTO, is that called CDO, what does that mean? Chief Development Officer, so I had uh, both the engineering, product marketing, and product management under me. So under John, uh, essentially a team of over 29,000, mostly engineers, it was a pretty large team, and drove about uh, $38 billion in annual revenue for the company. So it was a pretty good sized job. 29,000 engineers, where, where, where were they based? Is India here, uh, everywhere? Global, global actually. Yeah. They were, uh, uh, San Jose being the big base, obviously. But besides that, India, uh, in Europe actually, all over. We had engineers in UK, we had them in Norway, we had them in France, we had, them, we had a pretty big team in Israel. Uh, uh, and uh, we had a team in uh, China, the Webex team was, in China, so we were like you know in a number of countries around the globe. What does that mean to manage twenty nine thousand engineers? You're a manager of managers of managers. What are the types of problems you're working on for for the average person listening day to day? Maybe who maybe some of the people listening might manage five or ten engineers. Like I, I've never even thought of what it would take to manage that many people. What, what do you spend your time on? Well, you focus your time and energy on uh, developing the strategy uh, for the company, and that's something that I did in concert with John. Uh, you know, and John was the biggest coach and guide for me uh, throughout the career. And so you develop a strategy, you get extremely close with the customers. So the exposure that I got uh, with the customers, and John was always uh, gently pushing us all to make sure that we are customer success obsessed, and we were. And uh, day in and day out, you are meeting with some of the largest service provider as well as enterprise customers. And you really get a sense of, it's not just an engineering job, it's about really managing the numbers. Because in our universe, uh, sales owned delivering the numbers, but engineering and product management 
own delivering the forecast. So we had to we had to deliver quarter after quarter. Uh, wh- what was something that we had to do? So strategy, customer relationships. And then obviously it's all about people at the end of the day because they're your biggest assets. What was fun, Joe, and you'd appreciate it given the number of startups you have, uh, we never got beat. Uh, We never got beat in our top 18 product areas. Uh, Most of the time we had between 40 and 70% market share. And we did it with a different approach to the market. Uh, We did it on understanding the customer's needs and producing Mm -hmm. outcomes for them and architectures. And it was a rush. It was. And (laughs) Pankaj is very understanding because when I gave him 180 acquisitions to integrate into engineering, you had all different uh, environments and backgrounds. And these 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 acquisitions were a big part of that. You see what the customer needs, make sure you own it ahead of time and integrate it. Exactly. Exactly. You nailed it. If we can get there and do it ourselves, we'd always do it ourselves. But most of the time, once a market take off, you can't think I'll be the 10th player into this market three years later and become number one. It doesn't happen. So if we weren't one of the first movers, we partnered with one of them or acquired. And, and uh, the people listening would enjoy it. We created 10,000 millionaires in our first 10 years. Amazing. So we shared the success across the whole company in a way that I, I think really should be the form of capitalism that everybody focuses on. We did great at the top, too. So no yeah. complaints at all. And when you when you stayed close to your customers, I mean, obviously you're, you're famously close to a lot of leaders around the world that you that you work with on these different things. Like, were the problems in the U.S. similar to the problems in the Middle East, similar to the problems in Europe, or were there actually very different problems around the world? No, the problems were the same. There's one thing about the internet uh, is the internet had a common language and a common goal and direction. Now the languages might be different, or the cultures you were doing was different, but it came back to if you treated your customers really well, they treated you well. The best of my knowledge, because you and I never had a customer we can go back to and either interface to or sell to again, and we'd move heaven and earth. I listened to every critical account every night myself, 365 days a year, because if the top leaders pay attention to it, our team does. And oddly enough, customers who had problems that you helped solve the problem, uh, even if it was created by us, uh, ended up being more loyal customers and actually grew faster than the ones who didn't. And that's the reputation you guys have built for yourselves, obviously, is you're a very positive son. The, the customers actually come to you to learn from you. To, they trust you. It sounds like you're still friends with a lot of these customers after all having left Cisco for a long time. Yeah, everybody would say all of them and they're customer oriented. Uh, you know, and the trust is huge. Most of the customers we've ever called on not only would see us again, they'd invite us in. Uh, out of the 180 acquisitions, almost all of them, it was a customer who told us we should buy them. And uh, we paid everybody in the company on customer satisfaction, which I don't think has been done before wow. or since on skill along that line. Wow. Well, speaking of not being done since, you guys are partnering again to build a new company called Nile, which I'm very excited about and involved in. Yeah. Uh, we, have, we have the two of the biggest names in the industry joining together again. Pankaj, what is Nile and how are you guys reimagining the network? When I think about Nile, it's about reimagining the network. What do I mean by that? Uh, it means it's uh, secure, it's autonomous, and it is invisible. Invisible meaning it's like a utility. We never think about using power or water as something that we need to think through as to how it gets distributed uh, when we turn on the tap or when we flip a switch. Yep. It's very analogous to that. So what Amazon did for computing is what Nile is doing for networking. And explain that to people, because a lot of people don't know that much about networking. Right now, we turn on the Wi-Fi, it feels like a utility. What are some of the challenges that people don't see? There's, there's tens of billions of dollars to spend to kind of fix this right now, yeah, right? Uh, the, it's, a, it's a highly, highly complex industry, uh, uh, Joe. And uh, this complexity has been built in over the decades. Uh, so it was your fault from 20 years ago. <laughs> it actually was. You know, when I got to Cisco and we had a customer problem, I went down and talked to customer service. There were only a couple of people in customer service, so we had to change that. And I looked at him and said, we've got a problem. These are really hard to use. And, and the engineer said, well, we want them to be hard to use. We want only smart people to use them. <laughs> and that grew into something that Pankaj and I at first learned and participated in and then changed, where 75% of your cost of networks are the support costs, not the product costs. Wow. So Pankaj, what he's doing with his vision is we take the operational costs out. We make it very easy to use, very easy to install. So simplicity wins today. And when you take a step back, you'll get this in terms of venture capitalists. You know, and I look for a major business transition enabled by new technologies with a wicked smart CEO and his or her team, uh, that customers love the transition they're on, that they had the chance to be the number one and number two player, and it's a very large market. 
and that is tailor-made for what bank So, Joe, if I can, uh, uh, you're absolutely right, uh, uh, John. Uh, on the complexity side, uh, you know, this is, it has been in works for decades, even before my time, uh, and I, I clearly was a part of it, right? But, um, you know, the, the, and the, it's an ecosystem, and the, the way the ecosystem gets built is because in order to deliver numbers quarter after quarter, you are delivering features after features, yeah. right? Anytime you add features, whether somebody uses them or not, you are creating complexity. I'll give you a very quick example. Uh, we are, by the way, Nile is focused on campus networking, meaning within the building, within the enterprise uh, as a first phase. In campus networking today, there are over 10 different architectures. There are over 20 protocols. Number of knobs per protocol is in hundreds. Wow. Overlay that with the different revisions of the OSs. When you multiply these numbers, there are many, many hundreds of thousands of permutations and combinations. Th that creates every customer situation like a snowflake. Even though you bring the best AI in the world, you can't really help solve it. And this is what we are focused on. We are really focused on where customer never has to worry about and really changing the paradigm in the industry where when we deliver and as we are delivering it, this is really writing a new chapter where the customers and the organizations never ever have to worry about how to architect, how to design, deploy, secure, and maintain connectivity. Let's, let's dig in a little bit more on what that means on the technology side, just to understand. So you, you said even right now, even with some of the best AI, it's just it's just so complicated that the, you, you need people to solve it. You, you want to redesign it to allow AI to solve it. And you, you, you use AI as well? So so we do, but we we use it for a different reason, Joe. So we what we have done is, like, you know, all these architectures and the permutations and combinations I talked about, we actually netted it down to a single architecture. And we created this simple architecture where we can use that like a Lego block. And we can literally go from a deployment of 100 users to 5,000 users by uh, plugging in the Legos, uh, one on top yep. of each other. If we have made it that insanely simple. One architecture which can serve the need. When you think about a service, you don't have to worry about different knobs and different features and whatnot. It is a service at the end of the day, right? So it just creates a very different mindset. We use AI not for simplifying that part because we already have simplified. We use AI to fine tune the service so we can del deliver that in the most reliable, simple, and a secure way, which is going to be highly cost effective. Right. You know, when you think about it, um, what Pankaj has done is they've taken the complexity out of the networks entirely. And it's hard to do that unless you build them yourself. Yet many companies or individuals who have built it over the years, great companies, uh, they don't have the courage to reinvent themselves and disrupt themselves. And so if you haven't done routing, if you haven't done switching, if you haven't done wireless, if you haven't done security to build a common architecture and then take the complexity out, and it was designed from a yeah, clean sheet say. of paper uh, up. So it's a chance to change an industry. And we, you know, you've seen this movie before. It's what Cisco did originally with, you know, with uh, IBM SNA and DECnet and Apple Talk and all the different languages, and then bringing together data, voice, and video over common architecture and disrupted both the large players but also the new startups. We'll see if we do it again, but uh, it looks pretty exciting. And, and I, I want to get some more lessons from you guys on building companies. You've bought sure. 180 companies. You've, you've done all of this. Like, for, first, first of all, with, with how you structured this, is there is there a reason this would have been harder to do inside of a big company? If you were, for some reason, still running Cisco, would this have been a lot harder to do inside of Cisco? Would this have been more likely to be something that was separate that you bought? Or how, how, how do you think about that? Well, again, we'll, we'll do it together, but uh, the first thing is it's hard to get a big company to disrupt its current revenue streams and also to destroy its business models. Uh, even if you have the insight to do that and the courage to do it, you've got to get people out of their comfort zone and say you've got to design things differently and think entirely out of box on how to do it, and then you've got to be able to attract the right talent. So mm. traditionally, the large companies have not been able to do that, and that's in part why we did spin-ins at Cisco as well. Absolutely. Uh, but this, this required a 
whole new start with people that have already done it, and uh, it would be very difficult for any large company to do. Now, once you've given us a five-year head start, it's going to be really it's hard. It's really hard for them to. And you, yeah. you guys have been building Nile and Stealth for nearly five yeah. years with over 100, 125 million dollars in funding. It, like, tell us more about your unique approach to building it. Like, how do you say start this? Absolutely. So, uh, Joe, before I um, before we formed the company uh, officially. I'd been working on the vision uh, for more than a year. I actually uh, checked all the landscape, uh, all the companies which had uh, come before this, doing the small part uh, uh, prior to that. And uh, we were we were pretty sure what we, were, we wanted to do. Uh, this was one of the reasons why we were in a stealth mode for long, because um, we knew we wanted to deliver this as a service. Delivering something as a service versus delivering a product are very, very different things, right? Yep. Your mindset is very different because when you are doing a product, you know, if there are a couple of software bugs or something, well, you'll do an upgrade. I mean, when you are delivering a service which is always on, which is highly reliable and highly secure, uh, you know, you need to make sure that it's going to be ironclad when it comes out, day one. Yep. So this is one reason why we focus for a number of years inside, we used their own service for quite some time. And frankly speaking, to your point about the amount of money that we raised, um, we were fortunate that we raised the money that we did. Some really smart investors. Why not <laughs> yeah. <you're> <laughs> <probably Yeah>. <laughs> an investor? <laughs> uh, that, that, by the way, actually gave us a, a lot of freedom to do what we wanted to do, right? Because some of the companies, they, they want to go out and they want to tout their company because they want to be on VC's uh, uh, radar to say, hey, this is going to be a cool company and whatnot. You know, we had no pressure, honestly. And uh, also, we didn't want any distraction um, uh, for what we needed to deliver. Being in a quiet mode, we were able to, and uh, John has been at this uh, longer and he has seen this, I mean, we were very fortunate that in a startup of this size, uh, r coming right off stealth, we had lined up 50 plus partners. That's not easy to do. And these are- It's never been done. These are global, very large partners, right? And then the last one, we decided to come out of stealth because we are creating a market transition. We are creating a market category. Mm -hmm. It goes back to that famous book, uh, Play Bigger, right? How the players and the pirates and the uh, innovators uh, uh, innovate and dominate the markets, right? I mean, that's what this is about. And uh, you, uh, in order to do that, finally, we had to come out of stealth to say, hey, now it's time to- Teach people what you're doing. Do it. And, 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 and John, when, you, when something like this remains, enterprise networking has been broken for so long, it takes mm -hmm. on this aura of invincibility. Mm -hmm. Like, why, why is Nile able to do this now? Like, why now versus 10 years ago? Well, I, I think a lot of things came together uh, uh, in direction. Uh, the CIOs around the world don't want to do things that other people can do better. Uh, they don't want to have a, hard, a large amount of their staff just making the data centers work or making the networking gear work. Uh, they want it just to work and they, they see that as, as context, if you will. Core is how do they produce results for them. And this has been one of the few times where when the team put in the products, people came back and said, we saw a change day one and you were right. We, we didn't necessarily believe that you'd be able to do this without a management team and a staff and it'd be easy to use. Uh, the second thing is when you're talking about a next generation of an established concept category, you've got to start off with a blank check and a blank sheet to really design it right. Uh, and then you've got to move quickly in terms of the direction. So the ability to really scale rapidly is one of the key elements we looked at as well. And as always, it was customer driven in terms of the end result we wanted. For it. Uh, John, if I can add uh, uh, something to that too. Uh, by the way, this this is something I uh, learned from John over the years. Uh, and uh, we both spent uh, our early years in the computer industry. And we saw what happened to very powerful computer companies in Boston because mm -hmm. we worked there, right? And the lesson was, if you don't pay attention to market transitions, it can wipe you out, right? Uh, and uh, one so... Uh, to answer your question about uh, why this was not done 10 years ago or something, I think there were three factors. Uh, one was emergence of cloud and IoT. 10 years ago, cloud was in a very infancy stage, as you know. I mean, AWS was just coming out, right? And becoming uh, uh, pretty, uh, like it became dominant later on, but it was early. Uh, second one is about uh, emergence of AI, ML, and the bots. <laughs> Today, we talk about chat GPT, but like, you know, five, six years ago, Everybody was like, 
try to hide behind the word AI that, well, I do AI, you, you do AI, right? So, but now it's becoming more and more common in every aspect of life. And the last one about a business model. If you remember, Joe, uh, even five, six years ago, a lot of enterprises were not ready to adopt a piece of software per user per month. Today, we don't even think twice about Okta or Slack or Zoom or anything. As a, So I think when I saw these three major market transitions coming together, and when I overlaid that to four decades of complexity in an industry which has not been disrupted like compute and storage did, it was the time. Well, we've disrupted multiple industries multiple times, the big incumbents and the startups. But the other thing is such ease of use. If you really watch, almost no one stays on top for more than two decades. And you get too comfortable and unwilling to change. And there are a lot of really big players big that we will disrupt. Uh, but we also are moving with a speed. It's going to be hard for the small ones to keep up with us as well. Can it be as big as we dream? I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, but it is about execution, Joe. It's not for lack of strategy or the opportunity. The total available market is there. Uh, the strategy and vision looks good. It comes down to can we execute. Yeah, so you, you mentioned how many markets you dominate in the state number one. And what are some of the lessons you can apply from having dominated markets before the year to, to, to what you're doing now? Ah, well, you do it a combination of do it yourself, partner, or acquire. And if you watch what uh, uh, you'll see it now, we'll use the combination of all those, a partnering company from the beginning. At 50 partners with a company that has no revenue is unheard of for channels. Yeah, uh, and the ability to move with speed. Uh, the other thing is it is just so easy to use. And that's that's the mistake if we had it to do over, we would have yeah. done differently. Yeah. And then as a service that's there, think about what Cisco did to all the networking companies. Think about what Amazon did in the cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, think about what Apple did in terms of ease of use. That really is what now is going to do this industry if we do it right. Yeah. And how Absolutely. are you guys applying lessons with talent? Like one thing that's really impressed me, Pankaj, is that you guys not only have a great engineering team in India of really top people, but your attrition there is lower than all other companies I've seen. So it's actually pretty common, especially in India right now, people get paid higher salaries, they're trying to move up in the world, become yeah. more upper middle class, and they hop around a lot. And you've managed to keep people there very loyally on your team as far as I've seen. Like, like yeah, what, 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 what are you doing with the culture? So this is, actually, that's an excellent question, uh, Joe. Um, uh, it goes back to uh, many years of experience uh, in India. Uh, I was fortunate uh, that in mid-90s, when I came into Cisco, uh, John gave us um, uh, literally a, a lot of freedom to go and do something, uh, start something in India. Few of us started a small group back in the mid-90s. And, uh, and then eventually that group grew to a group of uh, six to 8,000 engineers. Uh, it was like a giant, giant group over a period of time. We learned about the engineering culture locally, what matters to them. And one of the things that I have always, uh, thanks to the lessons once again from John, uh, we have always kept culture regardless of where you are, uh, front and center, right? Always the work culture front and center. That has actually paid off very well. Our attrition, by the way, in India is in low single digits, which, uh, by the way, for most companies, startup and otherwise, it's like big double-digit attrition uh, throughout, which we don't have. And so I what, what are some of these things you do for culture? Yeah, so I think some of the things that we do for culture, uh, you know, it begins with, um, and it might sound uh, like, gee, you know, I've heard this before many times, but it's like walking the talk. Uh, we believe in honesty, openness, transparency with the team, right? And we say, look, uh, we want you to focus on innovation and simplify. You know, number one, we are going to be customer obsessed all the time. It's about one, one team, one mission. Results matter. You know, and I I learned this long time back. Don't confuse the efforts with the results, right? So, so, so I wonder who said that. To you. <laughs> so I think that that helps a lot. And the one last point I want to make, Joe, is that you know people. Uh, this is a team where we have hired people with the average experience of about fifteen to twenty years. This team has delivered multiple generations of products in India, right? Mm -hmm. For big companies. So for this team. Working on a cool platform is very important. Uh, having freedom to innovate is very important. So the team that we have for them, compensation is important no matter where you go. However, that's not the most uh, dominant these, thing these for these guys. Team. Have already won before; they want to win again in a big way. Yeah, together. exactly. And they, they want to leave their own imprint in the industry. That hey, I was part of this big journey. 
You know, when you think about it, uh, the currency of a company is purely their track record, uh, their relationships and trust, true of leaders and others. When you've done it multiple times, people trust you. And then Pankaj is right, you got to walk the talk from the top down. Uh, but the ability to track the best talent in the industry is based upon people who've seen us do it before. Yeah. And so far, we've been able to do it again and again. And we have the courage to disrupt ourselves. And Absolutely. we've made mistakes. And you actually, Joe, learn more. It's like your startups. You learn more learn from more your from mistakes, mistakes than you do your successes. You hit it right earlier. Vision and strategy is what most young startups focus on. Culture is equally as important. Warren Buffett got that right. If you do both of them together, then you can lead an industry. Are there, I want to... I want to go out on a limb. So mm-hmm. you're from you're from West Virginia, and you seem to you, you go back and do a lot of good philanthropy there, and you seem to have a lot of a lot of you you you're, you're someone who inspires more loyalty than almost any any other leader I've worked with. People really like working with you; they're very loyal to you. Is there anything from your background or your past or your culture growing up that you think gave you some of that ability? Like, where does that come from? Well, it, I was fortunate to have two doctors as parents, and my dad taught me the long term vision, uh, and my mom taught me the emotional approach. Uh, I'm dyslexic. And when you're dyslexic, uh, you never left somebody else. You always say, how can you help? Because you had troubles and challenges mm-hmm. growing up. But I also learned West Virginia when I grew up was at the center of the universe. We're the coal mining center of the world, 250,000 coal miners, greatly paid, 6,000 engineers. We were the Silicon Valley of the chemical industry, Carbide, FMC, DuPont. But because we didn't change. We get left behind. Now we're going to try to correct that, Joe. Mm-hmm. And it's a journey that we're on now. But coming around, it's a movie we've seen almost every phase of before. And we've goofed it up at least once, which is a real advantage because you know what to do differently. Tell us a little bit. I think people are interested. What are you trying to do to, to turn West Virginia around? What are you doing? Fun well, the vision on that is to become a startup state. And uh, it is not doing it as a series of transactions, but outline how you're going to change the academic agenda, how you're going to graduate uh, your students from the two great universities there, West Virginia University and Marshall. Both of their their presidents are completely bought into the program. Uh, you focus on the outcomes and we'll train people for where the jobs will be. You then outline a startup mentality. And as you know, most of your startups, whether they're here near Stanford or near University of uh, Texas at Austin or near MIT in Boston, they tend to congregate around the innovative type locations. And then you create the environment where you get it going. We've got 35 startups at the university from zero. Uh, we've a attracted now $10 billion projects into the state. Uh, We have the support of the Democrats and Republicans completely united at the national level. Two great senators, uh, Shelley Moore Capito and Joe Manchin. Uh, We have the governor, the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, and there is no disagreement. We know that if we don't change, we get left behind. And there's nothing more motivating than a common vision of what needs to be done when you know if you don't, the outcome is something you do not want. You sound a little bit like someone who's advised a lot of people on this sort of problem before. I know you've talked to a lot of heads of state. You'll, yeah. you, you'll go and you'll help them with their digital transformations. These types of problems come up around the world where people mm. are trying to do this as well. Oh, exactly. I did it originally, and I had the honor to do it in Israel with Shimon Peres, a, a tremendous president. He was president amazing. There. I met him oh. a few times. Oh, yeah. he, he was a great yeah. friend and almost... In some ways, a second father in some ways for 17 years. Uh, He taught me a lot about life and dreaming big, et cetera. And uh, you had the prime minister, uh, uh, Bibi, who was there. And there was a vision on how to change it. But nobody paid attention to us when we did it in Israel. Everybody knows they are just so innovative. But when we did it with France with uh, Macron, where I'm the French high-tech ambassador for him. And France went from the worst startup environment in Europe to the best in just five years. Uh, awesome. State of uniform, uh, unicorn growth is the fastest there. You see Macron literally being the champion of that. And he says, here's the advantage for all the citizens. And then uh, in India, I'm chairman of the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum, which is how businesses work together between the U.S. and India, but we took it to startups and people. And uh, Prime Minister Modi is the most aggressive in the world about a digital India and how that changes his economy. You watch uh, one economy that's going to outgrow the rest of the world for the next decade, it'll be India. Wouldn't surprise me to see him grow in the 9 to 11% range for a decade. So uh, being a part of that is a rush and it's exciting, uh, but it also comes down, you want to treat people and have everybody have a chance in life. And so it's going to be a startup world in the future. That's where almost all jobs will come from. That's amazing. Pankaj, you spend a lot of time in India for, for Nile and in general. You agree it's going to grow for a long time? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It will. And, uh, you know, actually, India has an uh, incredible pool of talent in general, but especially in networking, it has been built over the last 25 years. Uh, it will be. And uh, we actually already are deployed in 
India in multiple companies uh, right now. We are deployed outside of uh, uh, U.S., in Israel, in India, in uh, Europe, and now we are starting in Japan and uh, Singapore. So. And, and Pankaj, you're the CEO now. John is the chairman. So now, so now you have to play John in meetings. Uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> how is, how is I'm this? learning the Southern accent, you know, yeah, but it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's getting there. <laughs> what are, what are, what are, do, do, is there ever something that you have to like push yourself to do say, just what John would do in this situation? Is that ever you, come up? You do. You know, it's uh, mentally you get ready and say, you know, in a situation like this, uh, what would uh, John have thought? And at the same time, and you get the inspiration. Fortunately, he's only a phone call away. But uh, also, you know, a lot of lessons uh, learned uh, over 25 years sitting next to him and being on the calls. We get the calls with the customers all the time. Uh, you know, you you learn enough, and uh, you are able to put that in practice uh, all the time. And I think well, this is this is an amazing journey that we are on right yeah, now. Yeah, but Pankaj is one of the most humble people I've met. He's wicked smart, as you already know, Joe. Uh, secondly, he gives everybody credit except himself uh, on it. He is very good. Some things he will do differently than me, and they'll be for the better. But together. We're tough to beat, yeah, and we is. have a lot of fun. It speaks really well. Brothers, to actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we look a little yeah. bit different, but brothers. It speaks really well to both of you to work that closely together for 25 years and keep doing it. They yeah. still like that's each other a lot. That's, that, that's really amazing. You know, so we started American Optimist to push back on some of the cynicism and pessimism we're seeing. Yeah. Like a lot of young people think the world is hopeless, is, things are negative. Like, what, what would you say to people? Like, what's, what's your view of the future? Well, I think your attitude can be self-fulfilling. Uh, we talked about Shimon Perez before. He he taught me that there's no room in the world for smaller dreams. Yeah. And I think both as a country, especially in the U.S., uh, but also around the world, technology will level the playing field. When we said Internet would change the way you work, live, learn, and play, people said it's zeros and ones moving around. We said, no, we'll change our lives. And I think we're just getting started. So I think we need to dream bigger. And then... Organizations, including government, uh, needs to think more out of box about how do you create innovation and how do you bring those benefits to all uh, the employees. So I think as a group, dream bigger, have courage, not just for optimism, but we can make this happen. And we're going to do it all of technology as the enabler. And, and, and Pankaj, what gives you hope for the future? Well, I, um, I really hope that uh, uh, dreaming big uh, also regardless of where a person is, uh, what start of life, everybody can imagine. Uh, uh, you know, imagination is everything. Einstein once said that uh, imagination is the preview of life's uh, coming attractions, right? And that's what life is about. So I mean, like, you know, imagine and uh, think something big. And I think with Nile, I, I personally feel that uh, a, a network uh, in particular uh, uh, is embedded in every walk of our life. Uh, today, right? And it will continue to. That is the future. That will continue to. So I think if we are able to really rely on it like a utility where we never have to think, it's simple as anything. It's uh, very high performance. It's secure, right? And it's affordable. That is the future of uh, network as a service, which is what Nile is championing. And uh, I hope it truly turns into network at your service in the future. That's amazing. You know, I, I actually spent time with Shimon Perez right before his death. I think it was yes. about four or five years ago. And he he didn't, he must have passed away a few months later, but he, but he felt perfectly healthy. He was in his 90s. And he was explaining to me how he was starting his next career because he'd already founded Israel and all these other things. Yes. But he was he was so optimistic on the future with what you could do with technology and innovation. And, and he was going to make that the next 10 years of his career. And even though he never got a chance to do that, I thought that was such a cool way to, to be as a, as a leader. It is. And he's always been so exciting on inspired inspiration from everyone. He dreamed big, uh, whether it was dreaming how to make a startup state or how to bring peace to the Middle East. And he always pushed you outside your comfort zone. I brought him in to uh, speak to a number of the VCs in the Valley and some of the hot startups. And uh, everybody was sitting around the table, about 12 of us. And yeah, we thought it was going to be an entertaining evening. And he started talking about how to dream and how to think about things differently. And all of a sudden, everybody in the room was getting a piece of paper <laughs> out and taking notes. So he taught all the way to the end. Uh, he was very courageous. And I'll tell a story your listeners may get a kick out of. Um, when he was coming over, this was at a time that there was a conflict between Israel and Iran, and there were some real dangerous situations developing. So we had a lot of security from multiple different agencies around the house. And they said, John, the only thing you can't do is he's got to stay in three rooms. And uh, you can't let him get in the other rooms and definitely can't leave the house. And we're so sitting there discussing. He said, I understand you've got a new electrical car. And I said, yeah. He said, I want to go drive it. 
<laughs> and uh, I said, Mr. President, your, uh, your team told me you, I could not leave this level with you. He said, I am the leader, am I not? And I said, let's go. <laughs> On the way down, his, his chief of staff grabbed me. He said, John, Shimon hasn't driven a car in 10 years. He doesn't have a driver's license. And I said, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> we got down there, and he got in the car, and he asked a series of questions on how does it work and everything else. And the point that we're all making, he had the courage to get outside of his comfort zone and to dream big. And I think he's a great role model. But that is a common ingredient the great leaders have. Modi definitely has it in India. He dreams very big. He'll change that, that country in a big way. And I think by creating the environment, Joe, that you do, where you have startups and you help coach them to be able to make these big dreams come true, that's what we're going to do yeah. for now. And, and oftentimes you get to learn from them, of course, as well. Oh, yeah. Thank you. What well, we learn from yeah. each other. Exactly. Well, thank you guys very much. That's a great note to end it on. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure.